<laughs> Easy. So I guess like my first question is probably the question you're going to get hit with a lot. Obviously, Hyperviolence is kind of this amalgamated album that hosts all the songs from the Break the Rules EP. Now, this is quite a controversial topic and it's gaining even more controversy than the whole debate of how many singles you get and all that. So obviously you guys are kind of in favour of these amalgamated EP albums, but I'd be keen to hear your thoughts in a little bit deeper detail. Like what made you do this? Do you want to answer this first, Indy, or would you like me to take it? Uh, I reckon the the label was the biggest influence uh, on on doing it that way, wasn't it? I I, w I would say it was a factor, but I, I would say we'd had a lot of conversations with all of our team, both in management amongst the band and the labels, and um, um, we felt like the landscape of releasing music um, was a bit more sort of single-driven. Mm. Um, and that, I suppose that also influenced the way that we were writing some of the songs for the album, of course, but, um, you know, we've sort of looked at a lot of, um, releases in more recent times and yeah, the sort of the album model, um, that we've sort of all collectively grown up with is sort of something of the past now that yeah. we've got streaming and, um, yeah, that, I think that definitely influenced it. Um, and I think, you know, it's fitting for the kind of music and, um, kind of album that we wanted to make anyway. We wanted to make something that was quite present and in the moment um, of now and, and sort of looking to the future. So, um, yeah, I think I think there was a, a lot of different factors that influenced us in in sort of dropping this sort of waterfall of singles. Um, yeah. And it also watching... just gives us a... Sorry, bro. You keep going. <laughs> no, no, no. Go on, go on. <laughs> I was just say, we'd been watching like how um, a lot of other bands in the... Uh, a lot larger bands like um i mean there'd been some really successful releases from like sleep token uh that one comes to mind first uh there were a couple of others that they were we were watching and and they had the waterfall sort of structure going on and their mm -hmm. releases went really really well mm -hmm. and it um it gave access to a lot of songs before the album and uh, allowed their audience to digest those songs um without the kind of pressure of having to listen to a whole album uh, which is why I think it's that album structure that Liam's talking about is failing a lot nowadays because people just have a lot shorter attention spans or a lot less time to sit through a mm. whole album. So it gives a it gives a bit more respect to the songs, I think, in a way as well, where you can really mm. highlight more than what you normally would be able to with a normal structure of release. Mm. Absolutely. Um, and I think the other thing... I had a thought then and it was, it, it just escaped me during all of that. But I think, I think also it's a good opportunity for us with like the amalgamation of sounds that you're talking about um, to kind of give a taster of a lot of different things mm. um, and test the waters. And I think also for that's, that's, I remember the thought I was going to have now. Okay. Um, we've also noticed like, it's almost a, a response to how the, the love language album campaign went, which, which, which was more, you know, representative of a traditional album structure where there was sort of three singles, but they came out in such close succession. And I don't mm -hmm. think it gave enough time for people to get enough eyes on the final release in the end. I mean, it's still, got, it's, it, uh, as we know, it's, it's still got a lot of eyes in it and it, and it did what it did. Yeah. Um, but we've even noticed just in our own analytics and watching from Sirens to now, just the opportunity of each single kind of getting more eyes and building and building and, and kind of working more for a band of our size. Um, mm -hmm to kind of focus on that so that when we do get to the the release point of the, the album, um, you know, it, it it's it's getting the maximum amount of eyes that it possibly could have rather than minimising that time. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Um, yeah. Turnover was another good example of um, the release thing as well when we were talking about examples. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, anyway. well, it's, it's funny that you mentioned Sirens because I was going to go to that, like, at the end, but I think it's quickly risen to become one of your most streamed songs if not the most streamed song was there a time in the studio where you felt like that one was a little different or when did it start becoming apparent to you that it had the recipe for what your audience would and beyond was really craving right now oh we wrote was sirens sorry yeah. yeah we wrote sirens uh we wrote sirens and then it became the single that we're going to put out quite quickly 
Uh, we had like some of the other songs done already, but Sirens came out because we go away and we write in in weekly structures. Like we'll we'll book out like two weeks or like a week, and we'll all go away and we'll write. And um, so we'd already been on one or maybe two writing weeks before the week that Sirens was written, and we knew. I think we knew that we had a single that needed to come out and we hadn't even thought about what it would be yet, but then we wrote sirens. Uh, and Liam, I think you wrote the chorus melody for it, or you came mm. up with it. And I just remember all of us were like, this is a bop. This is a, like there's something about the chorus that just made us go like, yeah, this could totally be the next single. Yeah. Do you remember if sirens was the, the demo idea that Jesse came with us and he was saying, he was calling it like the disco one. Or was that break the rules? Yeah, I can't no, remember. He, he brought, he brought the sirens breakdown, I think, or like the verses. There was yeah. all that deal, 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 beep, 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 yeah, deal yeah. stuff. I couldn't remember whether he wrote the, I thought he might've done the, the, the chorus section musically. And then, and that's kind of where the base of it started. And then we, we started yeah, coming up with melodies, but yeah, um, we, we, Indy and I, kind of tackled that chorus together and and we knew that it was going to be a really catchy upbeat song it had the balance of the heavies um but obviously still really kind of showcased the the melodic stuff a lot more and um especially at that time i felt like uh or we felt like it was it was imperative to kind of keep the core of what wind waker was because you know it was so early on in the transition of of front men as well so kind of to contextualize that a little bit um yeah. it was a yeah. very pivotal single for us mm, we knew, we knew it, there was a lot of pressure on the next single that was going to come out yeah because <laughs> at that time only left in the dark was out um yeah. and that was really that got that got released really as a as a way of kind of showcasing the new vocals while also having something new to deliver for those two tours at the end of that of 2022 yeah so um yeah, sirens. We we had this. I had this melody that was sort of humming out. There's a. I think there's a reel or a you know, YouTube short or something like that of the process that we did. And then, um, Indy and I knew that we had to have some sort of like, kind of weird evocative lyric to kind of just open that chorus with. Oh yeah, um, yeah. And and, yeah. and 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 Indy was just like, what about like something of like girls on white horses? And I was just, <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, okay. This is like kooky enough that this will this this will stick, you know. Um, and that was that yeah, was that's so true. Yeah, that was like a real because we kept point. we 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 kept like we had the melody and we were like, I don't know, it's almost like we knew that it was gonna be like the next single. I mm. maybe we'd said it or something, and we and we were me and Liam were talking. We we're like, we we were trying to write like sort of regular lyrics for the chorus because we were like, well, if it's gonna be the single, the chorus needs to be really like relatable like, and yeah. yeah, relatable and digestible. And everything we wrote, we were just like, nah, that's not it, that's not it. Yeah. And then I was like. I kept thinking like so many of like the real big songs that bands have uh, have really obscure lyrics in the chorus. Yeah. And I remember like the one that I was thinking of the most at the time of writing was um, that Panic at the Disco song, like their most famous one where it's like, I chimed in and I haven't <laughs> yeah. ever heard of. And I was like, when you actually look at those lyrics on paper, they're fucking weird. <laughs> And um, and I was like, that's what we need. We need yeah. something like super weird that's just gonna be like weird enough that it's even more memorable if you than if you did something sort of basic. And then I was like, I don't know what came to me. I was just like, Liam, what about like I'm thinking of girls on white horses? And he was like, Yeah, all right, yeah, okay, we can <laughs> roll with that. And then he like started adding to it, and then yeah. It was funny that you used um Panic at the Disco as a reference reference because with the melody and how I performed it at least when we were sort of demoing it out it really gave me like a you know early 2000s fallout boy kind of vibe yeah. like I yeah. felt like I was singing like a Patrick Stump almost like <laughs> um and I wanted and and then kind of with panic getting sort of thrown in there as well like the just that kind of like juxtaposition of like the girls and boys sort of splitting that in the chorus sort of structure. I just mm. felt like it was just like a real cool, like way of just being like everybody now and like kind of almost displaying uh, at least the chaotic, you know, uh, confliction kind of part of, you know, the themes that's that eventually mm. would run through the rest of the album as well. But um, yeah. I just felt like it was a good kind of 
contrary kind of thing to do um, with that chorus. And yeah, it really started with that line that Indy just threw at me and I was like, all right, that's it. Let's run with it. Yeah. Oh yeah, it definitely did its job because I can't tell you the amount of days. Like I would just wake up already with it stuck in my head and then the rest of the day <laughs> would be in there as well. Um, but I guess just to move on from that, maybe this is m- more a question for you, Indy, I'm not sure. But I guess looking at the transition from all the way back to like my the My Empire EP and now to hyperviolence, I guess the frequency of like sampling and electronic layering has picked up quite a lot. Mm. Did the band in its entirety have to like learn new skills with their instruments or learn how to sample, or were these just feeling like something that was a natural progression to your instrumental skill? Yeah, it's an interesting question because back during Empire. Liam was still in the band and yeah. he actually did most of the electric electronics for us back then. So <laughs> we and, um, and on fade before that too. And on oh, fade, yeah. So yeah. we had that fade EP and we hired Liam before he was in the band to come and do all of the electronic elements for the EP because uh Chris just didn't think he was up to scratch for it and Liam just was really good at it. <laughs> and then Liam ended up joining. Um, and then after you left for a bit, Liam, I think we, we lost that, uh, element, Mm. but Lalek sort of picked up the reins, uh, Chris, I say Lalek, Chris Lalek, um, Chris, Chris sort of picked up the reins during love language. Uh, and he, like you're saying, um, had to learn to, in order to, mm. he had to learn a lot, a lot of skills in order to level up his electronic work and synth work and stuff uh, for love language. Um, and then Connor sort of came into the picture and Connor brought even more skill into that. And mm. Connor's the main reason that there's way more synth and sample stuff going on in the, yeah. in the new album and all the new music um, in the Liam era, because uh, that's just what he brings. He's he's an electronics person. He's influenced yeah. by all sorts of electronic artists. His favorite artist is Flume. Um, so he's constantly like, whenever we're writing, he's like, oh, I could do something really cool there. And then he comes back and then he just plays this thing and it's like this weird metallic sound and like, thing. and it's just like, how the frick are we going to put that in the song? But then we figure out how to and it sort of works and it's really defining a lot of our sound at the moment, which is great. It's, it's a good um, balance of like with all the people that sort of dabble in the the synthesis and the, the the electronic side of things because, you know, like Chris and I, I think we we occupy, uh, I guess, more of a songwriting kind of space when it comes to our applications of um, of electronic music, um, mm-hmm. and it's a lot of beats and and that sort of stuff. Um, and you know, like I'm I'm really big into my sampling. I'm massive hip hop head. And that's kind of where that sort of initial part of it from the empire era kind of came into it. It was sort of like bringing those influences, but like sort of in a very more subtle way um, and kind of keeping the the heavy stuff is at the forefront. And now, now we've kind of flipped it a little bit and now we're trying to keep the heavy stuff in with the electronic stuff that we're making. But I think it's just, it's, I, can't, I, I guess it is an evolution, but it's always been there. It's always been in our skill set, and it's it's cool mm. thing to balance now because yeah, Connor's now adding things that I wouldn't know how to do, and that Chris wouldn't know how to do, and we're doing things that we wouldn't know how to, you know, each other does it. So it's it, it's cool. It's a cool balancing act. Yeah, yeah, those are the sort of things that really push our boundaries with how we like to write music because we're always trying to bring in elements that are external to the actual metal world, and. Um, yeah, there's so much playing around with different sort of sounds that you don't normally hear in in heavy music. And um, a lot of it comes from Liam and Connor that have these backgrounds in different genres and they love that sort of stuff. Uh, like there's a, there's a song on the album that Liam wrote. Uh, it's one of the slower songs on the album. And he came in and it was like this, there was this, the way that he wrote it, there's this one thing that he did where he like uses his breath as a percussive instrument in the song. And Mm. I was like, I would never think to do that ever. And I was so impressed and the song is so good. And I remember like after he brought it in and we started working on it together, I was just like, I turned to him and I was like, this is literally a Liam Ganein masterclass. This song is a Liam masterclass. (laughs) It was just like, (laughs) just like you'd never think to do anything that he's done in that song. 
um, the way that he does it because you could do it in a normal way. Yeah. But the way that you do it brings that element to the song that makes it so unique. And yeah. I think that's what we strive to do with our music anyway. So it's just that's how we work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think obviously that's where Wind Waker's charm comes from, like the essence of being like super extravagant, flamboyant, this mix of everything. And I was wondering, um, obviously you guys performed at Knotfest not too long ago, and the Knotfest lineup itself was quite an exaggerated age range this year. So was there a pressure to, or like to performing in front of like these really traditional metal bands mm. and fans? Like what how did that go down for you guys? I mean, it it sort of influenced the order and sequence in which we released music, obviously. I mean, it made, <laughs> yeah. it made Enter the Wall what it is because we were like, well, if we're going to play a festival like this with bands like this, um, we're going to need to be able to hold our own in a more traditional capacity. And, um, yeah, I, I, I think it was, I don't know, I... I I think it did it did influence us a lot, and um, I think I think that the for the most part we were thinking about like the first impression that we're really gonna to make and 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 really be considered considerate about how what what that first impression is and how how we're show showing ourselves off. Um, yeah, yeah. I hope, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it definitely it influenced the set list. It influenced a lot of decision making, but it didn't define uh, how we wanted to present ourselves. Yes. Either. Yes uh we wanted to still be true to ourselves yeah because like we can't change our music we are we are what we are you either Mm -hmm. like it or you don't and the reason that we're on that festival is because people resonate with our music and also it provides something a little different to uh what is on the festival already and and the people that organize these things want that range in the music and you never know. A lot of those, we've had a lot of people that are in that age bracket that absolutely love our stuff and think it's yeah. really cool and unique. And right. then we've got people that absolutely hate it as well, which is great. I think there's like a comment. There was a comment on one of our music videos that popped up after Not Fest. <laughs> and the guy it was like, I don't know who it was, but the comment is like, how I can't remember verbatim, but it's something like, how dare you guys come into my city with your, uh, yo-yos and your boom booms or whatever the heck <laughs> never come back to brisbane <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i just like lost my i lost it when i read that because i was just like <laughs> I, I have a clear image of what that person probably oh. looks like or whatever mm-hmm. but i think that's I, great you know that sort of stuff is conversation starting and you're never going to please everyone but it's yeah. important that you that you that you spur some sort of reaction in them, you know, yeah. rather, rather than bore them. At least they had a nice little aggressive yeah. reaction to us. Being the best or the worst is way better than being mid. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. Um, but I was going to say too, like, I'm, it's really cool to see people that are of like a certain age bracket um, that can identify with what we're doing based on things that have sort of, come and gone you know like yeah i suppose there's people that are finding or resonating with sort of more of i guess the new metal or the rap metal kind of uh crossover that we're doing um you know and likening it to things that they were you know nostalgic for you know 20 years ago i mean obviously we're doing it in a a different way but it's cool that people you know can liken us to a lincoln park or you know um a a limp biscuit or something like that i mean I, i haven't really seen that i think that's just us just want getting dusty but you know um no it's 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 really cool that um we can appeal not just to a younger demographic but you know all sort of all all you know age brackets my mom loves our music you know <laughs> and she doesn't <laughs> listen to, to he- yeah she doesn't listen to heavy music she doesn't like screams but she listens to us so <laughs> <laughs> well i feel like hyper violence kind of is this massive turning talking point for you guys like going on from the not first comments. And then I feel like there's some elements of going into this style where you have found yourself forced to gain this hyper vigilance about people misconstruing what you're doing in this AI fusion, because mm. we all kind of saw that incident that happened. <laughs> Is this something you've dealt with on more than that occasion? And how do you find yourself backing up from it? That think was, the- yeah. that was the first yeah odd accusation we've ever had online. Yeah. <laughs> uh 
that we we weren't expecting it at all because we were just like it was a release day and we were all pumped for it and then yeah. this this band that we'd never heard of started accusing us of using ai and being generic and we were like cry about it <laughs> like it's, it's, one it's not ai two i have no idea who you are not yeah. even going to respond we weren't really going to respond to it but we wanted to like you can't help what people say about you online that's just like we're we're all on the internet we know the internet well we know how it works you know if, if someone makes stuff up about you online it is what it is that's mm. their opinion but if the facts are wrong that's the only time where I'm like, okay, you got to actually disprove that because I don't want people thinking that we have used AI for our cover art, you know? Yeah. So we thought, oh, well, how can we do that without feeling like we need to respond to everything else? Oh, well, let's just post a picture of the AI art being made mm. and then write, cry about it because yeah. that that's, feels very wind waker of us. Yeah. I mean, like there's there's a nuanced response that I have to to that whole situation and I, ha I don't think I've had a... A, a full opportunity to sort of address it but you know for the most part i i think what they're they're talking about what they're tapping into there is not um totally off base you know i think that they pretty much kind of picked the wrong example in this case yeah um and i mean that was just the general consensus that we had as a band anyway i think but um yeah what they're saying is not wrong it feeds into larger conversations that i've read and, and and listened to about you know even where metal is going in a, in a more commercial sense and you know what what that means for more traditional forms of metal you know uh, and what that means for fans of traditional metal um, um not just metal i guess in in more in all sort of uh, musical genres in in this you know streaming internet based you know climate that we're in um but yeah it's just like it was just disappointing that that was sort of targeted to us because yeah, yeah we, we do, we do try to work hard at kind of pushing the, the envelope at, or, or challenging ourselves um, and to mm. be lumped in, to be lumped in with like essentially content creators online that happen to make music, you know, that's kind of how, that's the bucket that I kind of throw it in. Yeah. Um, you know, it was it, just a bad take. It was a shame. It? Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a it was an interesting take in terms of like the overall scene, but it was a bad yeah. take on us. I think yeah, it's like and I really, I don't know. I think I'm like, I'm with you, Liam. Like we've always been a band that is never going to write the same song twice. Is always mm -hmm. going to try and push the boundaries, and I think like the evidence for that is like the length of our growth has been slow but continuous, and it's only it's just started to sort of have that exponential push, which is great, mm -hmm. and we need that. Um, you know, we could, we probably could have written some stuff that fed into a, a bit more of a, a space, a universal space that allowed us to grow a bit quicker, but that's not us. Yeah. Mm. And yeah, we're just, yeah. Just go oh, sorry, you go, you go. Uh, I was just saying, yeah, it, it, we're, we're, all we're trying to do is just make music that's, that's true to us and, and the things that we like. Um, mm. that's really it at the end of the day and. Yeah, I, I I can see where they're coming from and and like what's triggered that. You know, obviously they've they've got a project that's that's been out for a few years that's of the same name, and it's just it it just happens to be coincidence based on being a one word title. Unfortunately, like um, yeah, mm. we 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 spent a lot of time thinking about the name for it, and it just this one was the one that stick. It's just what stuck. So yeah. Mm. That's all I'll they're, say about that. They're certainly not the first band to have the same album title as someone else, yeah. <laughs> you know. But um, you know, there's not much you can do. I I did like how in both your answers, obviously, you were talking about you know this growth and remaining true to yourself. And obviously, Hyperviolence is your sophomore album, and I think a lot of people will ask, you know, what did you learn and change from your album process and cycle? But I am more interested in, is there something that you found really worked in love language that you've kept maintaining or mm. something you've done in the process that you just had to do again for hyperviolence? Mm. I think um, we've always been a, a band that writes collectively and with love language, I think, let me think about this for a sec. I think what's worked for us, especially with love language has been our ability to combine the heavy and the pop elements. Mm -hmm. um, and people always tell us that 
we have really catchy choruses um, and then they get thrown because you come out of the chorus straight into this like really heavy section or something like that. And there's always very interesting aspects to our music that are genre blending. Yeah. Um, and we experimented a lot with that on Love Language and I think there were um, – there were some moments that really worked and there were some moments that didn't. And we sort of took the things that worked into how we started our writing process for hyperviolence, but it definitely didn't define how we wrote hyperviolence. It was very much an open book because of the fact that the lineup had changed and we've always written as a group and you'll never write the same way with different people. It's always going to be a, a, an adjustment and we, the best part about hyperviolence was learning how to write with a new group because mm -hmm. we had Connor was in and Liam was back in. Um, we'd written with Liam before, but it was, you know, Liam's a different person three years on. He brings new things to the table. Yeah. Why would we want to stick to how we'd written on love language when we have all these new opportunities to find something interesting? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's why I think a lot of us are in a band in the first place is to make art in a way that um, invigorates our creative souls and that doing that through collaboration. Mm. Yeah. I, I think I'll, I'll also add on to that. Um, you know, one thing like, obviously I can't talk too much about the, the love language writing experience not being there, but I can contextualize that a little bit with saying like, you know, we had a bit of a process on empire um, where we would, you know, sort of write the music and then the, the lyrics and the vocals sort of came afterwards. And I think the boys with on love, La when they were making love language, um, you know, spent a bit more time writing that in sort of synchronicity so mm -hmm. that there was a bit more of um I guess, I guess more of a consideration of like what role the, the vocals play. And yeah. I think that worked to the benefit of the songwriting on Love Language. So mm -hmm. we definitely tried to to keep that going um, and that process going with um, hyperviolence um, in terms of just like as the boys are writing the music, I'm, you know, either in the room on my notes app just like scribbling um, or I'm downstairs with earbuds in trying to like get this section down or all this chorus down as we're sort of getting it put together. Mm. Um, and I think that's, you know, something that's really, I mean, um, helped me a lot um, as well. And in, in terms of um, creating and expressing ideas that are a lot more cohesive with the music and, and, and also allow the music to kind of follow the vocals in a way, rather mm. than having this static thing that we just got to place on, place vocals on top oh, yeah oh. yeah you know I, I, mean? so, I will yeah. also add to that I think that's something we continued on with. <laughs> um i will also add that hyperviolence liam and i in particular really pushed for um it's a much he it's a much heavier album than mm -hmm. love language and we really yeah. pushed for that um and that's just, that just comes from observing the world and seeing how people are feeling now and there's a big resurgence in a lot of heavy elements to music um and the world's a lot angrier, angrier, I think, post COVID and still we recovering were, from a lot of stuff. And we were also so kind of going, going through a lot of turbulent emotions going into this process as well. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously all, things are all on good terms, but we, you know, there was a, there was sort of a grieving period in a lot of ways with what was going on and, um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of that, that loss that we had, but also the gain. You know, yeah. it was for a, for a long time. It sort of was hard to see it as as a gain with be you know be coming back to the band, and that's you know I don't I don't fault anyone for for feeling that way because you know it was it was at such a, a pinnacle point. You know, you yeah. just released a debut album, so there was there was a lot of you know feelings, and I think you know that that heaviness is sort of what reflects that, and you know even just the the anxiety of like okay, where are we going here? You know, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on it. There's just the heavy elements did come out of that. It also came out of the pressure of the second album and the new vocalist and being able to live up to the first album. Um, and yeah, albums, music is such a personal experience and a personal art form. And 
um, you're always going to get to the core of how you're feeling and how you're existing at the time when you're writing. Um, and usually, and hopefully that's what resonates with the listeners when it comes out. Mm. Yeah. And I guess, obviously you talk about this album having, you know, a lot of angry feelings and intensity. Um, it's obviously an opportunity as well for you guys to present that forward when you're playing shows. I mean, only a few nights ago, you were doing these greedy and sweaty small cap shows and it leads me to kind of wonder what environment do you think your very intoxicating live shows now fit in? Do you love it in these like hell to hell, like wall to wall pit venues, or do you guys find a different kind of confidence in the lights and production of a festival set? Where do you find yourself mm. more comfortable now? I think our music is heading or it, it's at least being considered um, in, in a way of translating to a bigger sort of space. Yeah. Um, it was really interesting playing, you know, a couple of nights, these new songs in a smaller space. Mm. It's mm. We've not had the opportunity to do so yet. Um, so it, it was certainly very interesting. And it, 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 it was great to note what parts about the new stuff was resonating and translating in that small space. Um, but I think there's, there's an element of like kind of, or awareness at least of where we are at and where we're going and, you know, really fast noty riffs and technical shit doesn't really translate to bigger venues. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we, we tried to consider a little bit on this album. Um, mm. You know, we might, we might return to a bit, have, having a bit more complexity in our musicality, you know, in the future, but for, for this one, at least we, we really tried to focus more on the songwriting and how that would translate into sort of a bigger live space. Yeah, it's true. We, um, yeah, it's all about goals, right? And where you where you see yourself ending up, and um, everyone that's in the band dreams of playing the bigger the bigger places, the venues, the you know the arenas, and mm. all that sort of stuff. And um, Liam's right; it's reflected in our in our writing. But I I still, I mean, if I had to pick one or the other, I'd pick the bigger shows just because I love going out to a massive crowd and just seeing all those people. And um, I think the the adrenaline rush you get is a lot bigger because there's, you know, the stakes are higher. There's more pressure to perform. Mm. That being said, playing these smaller shows has just reminded me how fun it is to be intimate with a crowd. Yeah. Um, and you don't get that at the bigger shows. You really, you really get to, there's a, there's a stronger connection with the audience at smaller shows because they're right there with you. And um, you, you really see everything and you feel everything. And, uh, the relationship between the audience and the performers is a lot more vivid, I think. Yeah, I'd agree. And and also like with these smaller shows too, it's it's you know, it's not some big production like we would on a bigger headliner mm -hmm. show. You know, I think we're now in a space now where we're trying to think about our live show and you know in a in more than just the music and the performance, but you know, what kind of experience are we gonna create, you know, with with extra shit with production and um yeah i think i think it's it's cool to to bring it to strip all of that away for for a few shows and and then really bring it back to basics and 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 you know as they say get the fundamentals right mm. um yeah it's 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 cool i do i do love the smaller rooms i love having that real close intimate connection um sometimes it's a bit daunting but i prefer <laughs> it over having that 2 meter gap with a barrier yeah. Yeah. you know it's it's so hard it like you have to work harder yeah. to get people to like really, you know, have that energy transfer. Yeah. Well, I guess you do kind of have some of these challenges coming up um, when you're embarking in a tour in the States, which is a massive bill to be on. But my, uh, you know, in a, this is my own inner monologue wanting to know, um, obviously there'll be the first shows with the whole album being out and your catalog has grown exponentially. Is there any internal conflicts as to what to cut, what to put on? Is there anyone <laughs> fighting for a certain song? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, massively. That, we're, we're, it, we've got a good, it, it's a good problem to have. And I think we yeah. all acknowledge that as a band. Um, you know, I think it's it's been the battle of like, 
we're in this new era now. We really, we should, we need to showcase it versus these people have been waiting so long and they've heard so many releases thus far and there's so much music to pick from, but we've got like 30 minutes, of, yeah. you know? So, um, yeah, yeah there, there's definitely been arg- uh, arguments. Not it's, it's not been that heated, but it's been like, you know, all right, what are, we, what are we cutting here? And then it's just like someone else will throw a spanner in the works and be like, we should play this. And it's just like, oh, <laughs> yeah. far out. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've but, really had to think about it. Yeah. The, obviously, we need to focus on the newer stuff. and and uh, But it's it's an audience that's been around for a while. He's growing, obviously, but there's people there that are asking for things off Empire. <laughs> and it's just like damn, we can't fit that in or can we? And then we have all these discussions about mm. it, uh, but we've only got 30 minutes and we have to just focus on on, on what we focus on. I don't know. It's diff- it's difficult to talk about when, when all of us want to play different songs because there is such a big catalogue. And also the fact that Love Language, because of, we had the vocalist changeover, Lo- Love Language's tour cycle and its whole album cycle really got cut short. And we were supposed to take that album overseas and we never got the chance to um, because we had to swap vocalists and move on as quickly as possible in order to keep the momentum going. Um, So we didn't get to take a lot of those songs, which we probably would have been able to take some Empire songs over during Mm -hmm. that album cycle. Um, And now it's an even more difficult process because there's even more songs. Um, And yeah, it's, it's a tough one because you want to, all you want to do when you go over there is just satisfy the fans that have been there since day one and yeah. then also satisfy the new fans. So what do you do? There's no answer. I, I Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, we can also cater to the people that do know us, but then there's also the consideration of like, well, there's going to be a lot of people that don't know us. And this is a, again, going to be a first impression, like not yeah. best. So what is going to be the most beneficial songs you know, what, what's, what's going to be putting our best foot forward. What's the best first impression we can make. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's songs on hyper violence that we we're probably not going to be able to play, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. um, but we, we, I think we've found a good balance with the set list. Um, we have, we have agreed on it now and you know, it's, <laughs> it's, in, it's set in stone. Um, I think it'll be very enjoyable for the audience. It'll be a good, good balance of stuff. And yeah, I think it'll yeah. just be all around good fun. I mean, we could have, we sort of settled on like it's not it's not our tour, it's not a headliner, mm. it's not an album tour. So of course we're not going to play all of Hyperviolence. Um, and you just go back to like what's the reason for us being there at that time, and what songs benefit that reason the most. And for us, it's like, well, we're going there; it's our first time in America. We're trying to grow our audience in America, and um, we're going to play the songs that we think will best do that. Yeah. yeah. And, Look, and then as we long can... as next time you're in Sydney, I still get Lucy. I will. I'll be happy with the decisions. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. yeah, Lucy's gonna be a hard one to ever get rid of. I think. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess just to like close this up, if you guys are both <laughs> could kind of describe what hyperviolence means to you in like a sentence or two, I'd love to know. Uh, okay. Um. Oh. Are you uh, sorry? I, I'm just going to ask this as a a, a precursor. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you asking what it personally means to me, or what I want it to like sort of display or represent? What it personally means to you. Okay, cool. All right. Um, hyperviolence personally um, is like a time capsule mm-hmm. of this moment. You know, coming out of COVID, having a lot of personal development. Um, and but also a bit of an identity crisis as well mm. um and stepping into something that's you know not completely in my control you know i'm not completely in control of how people are going to view me uh how people are going to receive me um and also how uh i'm coming to terms with that in a lot of ways so you know the album is in a lot of ways about these sort of two personalities that are within one host and um, that's kind of what I've tried to display conceptually throughout every song. Um, and it's about the development of coming to terms of like who you are versus maybe what you're expe- who you're expected to be and and basically finding that um, 
that synergy. And maybe those two personalities can interlock and, and it can be a balance and it doesn't have to be a struggle or a conflict or a fight. You know, that's what it means. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, for me personally, I mean, Liam's, the way Liam describes it is also for me the way that you would listen to the album in terms of thematically. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, I think it also uh, makes me think about the progression of myself and the guys in the band as people over the last couple of years and all the stuff that you go through and the amount that you can change over such a short amount of time because of certain things or because of experiences or even just a conversation that tricks something in you to make you a different person. Mm -hmm. I think um, when we first started writing the album to now, all of us are already quite quite different people and we're growing as people um, and as artists. And albums for me are a lot like, I don't know, kind, kind of like history books in a way where yeah. I, from a musician's standpoint, it's like that is a very specific moment in time in an art form that represents a journey over a couple of years with some very close friends of mine that mm -hmm. I'll always look back on and, and listen to. And it'll, you know, music's very, um, it's very influential in the way that you store memories. And when I listen to that album, I think of very specific things. Um, this is probably digressing off into like a very different way to look at the album from a, someone who's written the album. Um, so in the terms of like how someone would view the album, when they're listening to it, I would go back to Liam's answer. But <laughs> for me, it's very much just a yeah, um, yeah, a pocket in in time of of. That's exactly what I mean by time capsule. Like I I I see I see any release that I put my name to a bit like that. You know, it's um it's a chapter, and uh, I I I'm hoping to one day like look back on my career or musical journey, and and have these like time stamps. And and they 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 manifest in the form of a a release or or an album, you know. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's kind of what this is. Yeah. yeah. Well, I finally got my hands on the stream this afternoon, so I can listen to it very soon. And uh, those answers have made me much more well, even more excited to listen to it. So yeah, I'm very keen to get stuck in. Fantastic. And thank you yeah. for your time tonight as well, and for answering everything so in depth and well. I very much appreciate it. Pleasure. I hope I hope that um you get a bit of an experience when you listen to it from front to back because it is it is a it it's very much a psychological journey the way that it's written. Yeah. And it, I'm really interested to to see what people say about the actual album listen through. Yeah, uh, I, I'm so keen, yeah. <laughs> so keen. Hope you enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, thank you, and thank you again for your time. I hope you have a lovely rest of your night. Thank Thanks you, you so too, much. Georgia. Thank you for having us. See ya. See ya.